Station. I can't get no call to action, but I try and I try and I try. Hello and, try. and welcome to Call to Action, the go to podcast for anyone trying to make sense of the world of marketing, advertising, and beyond. In an industry that is a minefield of utter bollocks, we aim to capture our heroes and allies from the front line to have a chinwag with. It's like Pokemon Go, with the single but vital exception that it's not a short-term bandwagon of shite. It's brought to you by Gasp, and I'm Giles Edwards. Today, I've caught Blair Enns. The founder and CEO of Win Without Pitching, Blair has been labelled the agency world's disruptor and is dead set on getting creative businesses to price their work properly. He's advised hundreds of firms on how to deprogram themselves from their standard approach to winning new business. Penning two books, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto and Pricing Creativity, a guide to profit beyond the billable hour, Blair is single-handedly saving those who sell ideas and advice from the spawn of Satan, aka RFPs. Blair says if we are pomegranates, then we will resist being pushed into a process designed to compare apples to apples. Well said and welcome to the show, Blair. Thank you, Giles. It's my pleasure to be here. Right, we've got our seven quick fires, Blair. So tea or coffee, an easy one to start. Oh, phew, coffee. Alfonso Davies or Paul Stalteri? Sorry, what was the second one? The, less, the lesser name Canadian footballer. <laughs> Alfonso <laughs> Davies. I've, so re- recording during a World Cup. Yes, yeah. Alfonso <laughs> Davies. Right, RFPs or pitching? Neither. Value-based pricing or integrity-based selling? Both. Mountains or beach? (laughs) These are unfair questions. Yes. (laughs) A $200 logo or a $1 million logo? Oh, yeah. All of them. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a bit. And the last one's a bit indulgent on my part. Charge for the time it takes to do the magic trick or charge for the magic? Charge for the magic, baby. Here's our soundbite. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Blair. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So to start Call to Action, we always like to celebrate the weird and wonderful ways that guests have ended up where they are now in their, in their career. So if we go right back to the start, what was your first ever job? And then what was your first proper advertising related job? Oh, my first proper job was washing dishes. I was horrible at it. My first proper advertising related job I was hired originally as an account coordinator at the age of 20 or 22. It's all a blur. It's it's all a blur now in a full service marketing communications firm. It was a, it was a PR firm that had bought an ad agency. I was trying to get a job in public relations. They didn't hire me. And then uh, six months later, they called me back and said, Hey, we bought this ad agency. Do you want a job in advertising? And I said, yeah, sure. Fine. Yeah, 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 good. So account coordinator, is that like in an account management type department? Yeah, it's an entry-level account management. Because that always seems to be, certainly for our past guests, it seems to be like a gateway drug into advertising. Yeah, I think I was an account coordinator for six months or less, and then I was an account executive, they called them, which is funny, right? Account executive ranked, it went account coordinator, executive, manager, supervisor, director, back in my day. So I went from account coordinator to account executive to account executive in charge of new business all within tw- the first 12 months of my career. Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't know what the exchange rate is with job titles nowadays. And there's, there's definitely an inflation of sorts. I met someone who was a director and they're just fresh out of uni still. So I don't know what any of it means. But so did you was that very intentional? You knew you wanted to get into this ad land world? Or was that just uh, just an opportunity that presented itself? Well, when I was in, and I don't know what the UK equivalent is of junior high, it's not, it's past middle school. I won uh, the school-wide oratory contest with a speech on the subject of advertising. So in hindsight, once I kind of fell into it, it uh, uh, I realized it wasn't a coincidence. I kind of had this love for advertising and the creative side of it, although I, I've always worked in um, the account management and new business side. 
And was it comfortable to begin with? Because at some stage in your life, you started to notice that there were flaws in the way that agencies traded. Yeah, I'm not sure it was ever comfortable. It was fun. What it was was, and I've said this before, it's it's like a, it was like a rock and roll tour bus or a college dorm room. It was it was one of my bosses, the executive vice president. He made this comment about a com- a firm we were competing against. He said they're kids playing at business. And I thought, wow, that's us too. <laughs> in what way? You know, I I remember I was 22 years old. I'm brand new in the job. My boss hands me, I think it was eight clients. And he said, says to me, it's your job to know your client's business better than they know their business. Now, just think about that for a minute. I'm 22. I'm new to, to business, not just their business. Some of these people have been in their jobs, in their, in their roles, or in their organizations for decades. And I'm supposed to know eight businesses better than the people working in those businesses know them. It was a ridiculous statement in hindsight. I didn't, I didn't understand. I took it as a challenge in the moment. But the idea that I would know their businesses better, or even, even have the, the faculties. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad I was hired and given responsibilities that there's no way I could ever live up to. And I'm not saying that's the way that it worked in every agency. It was a middle Canadian market, an independent firm flying by the seat of their pants. And some of those, some of those like generalist firms in small to mid-sized markets are great training grounds for young talent because you get thrown into the deep end in all of these accounts and all of these scenarios. So I was there for two years before I worked, moved on to a multinational ad agency. But in those two years, I was out over my skis, as, as we say here in North America, meaning um, in over my head would be the more appropriate metaphor, every day for two years. But it was a fantastic way to learn. It was painful. It was painful for me. It was painful for the owners of the business. And I'm sure it was painful for the clients as well. But I learned so much. It was, so it was a valuable proving ground. Yeah, and so you, you came out with a few bruises, no doubt. Yeah, you know, I think I was too. I was when I was young, I was arrogant, and uh, uh, I probably didn't look at them as bruises. Maybe I did. I don't know. I'm 56 now, Giles. This is uh, this is uh, many decades ago. <laughs> You're casting your mind back. I'm dwelling on a part of my life I don't remember <laughs> enough. A little bit too long. So let's expose that some more. So what was uh, so what were the differences when you went to a larger multinational shop? Then was it immediately noticeable? The college dorm room was bigger. The people were smarter, working harder, and the level of fun was higher. There was still like there was still a certain amount of ineptitude, but there was also there was also a lot of competence. So you had this fuller spectrum of of the uh, kind of capacities and capabilities of people. The other prominent difference that hit me was how competitive it was. Everybody was working hard, but everybody kind of had their eye on their colleague next to them for the next promotion. So it was a competitive environment. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It was, I think, in a, in a largely po- positive way, it was quite competitive. And were you, you were still involved in winning new business and, and presenting and presumably pitching? No, when I went to work for the multinational, I was, I was uh, running a regional piece of a, of a large national account. So I wasn't involved in new business at the multinational level. Fast forward a few years, and I was hired to run a regional office of another Canadian agency in another part of the country. So there was, it was a Vancouver-based agency, another full-service marketing communication firm that had opened an office in Calgary on the other side of the Rocky Mountains. And um, the office imploded when the, when the person hired to lead that office left because all of the clients were friends of his. So I was brought in to rebuild that office. And the understanding was that I would stay for a year because I had these plans to move to this remote mountain village where I live now. One year turned into 20 months. It was a fantastic experience. But uh, so I had to, I had to build, I had to, I was in charge of getting the clients and then running the accounts. And, um, and then when I, said to my boss, hey, it's time for me to go follow this dream and kind of drop out and move to the woods. He said, how are you going to earn a living? I said, I, I don't know. I have a vague idea of a consulting practice. And he said, well, do you want to keep doing new business for me remotely? This is in the year 2000. 
while you're getting your consulting practice off the ground. So I did that for a year. Wow. And, and how, how tricky was that then to do new business remotely at the turn of the millennium? Because that wouldn't have been the norm. You know, what was interesting at the, at the, uh, at the turn of the century, the, uh, or the millennium, so 2000, the web as a business tool is relatively new still, as is email. So I was doing outreach via email. I was, I was primarily, sell, because it was still .com, the, the bust hadn't happened. I was primarily selling into California in Silicon Valley, going after tech businesses. And my email response rate for outbound solicitations was 70%, 70. So just if not open rate, response rate was 70%. Um, so it was actually quite easy. A couple of years earlier, and I couldn't have done it. Five years later, it would have been a lot more difficult. Yeah, so presumably a very successful stint. Yeah, not bad. Not as successful as I would have liked, but it was successful. And man, I sure learned a lot. I, I honed a lot of my thinking that I brought into my then consulting practice, Win Without Pitching, in that uh, year or so. And then, so uh, how long How long do we have to fast forward till you did start your consultancy practice? So I'm living in this remote mountain village in the middle of nowhere. I'm working for my old employer. And then after about a year, in actually uh, April of 20, 20, 2002, so 20 years ago this year, when Without Pitching launched as a solo consulting practice in 2013, I pivoted the business model to that of a training company started hiring people but the business is 20 years old today and in five days the whole team which is the team is five full-time people plus some contractors the team and our families were all going to california to celebrate our 20th anniversary well happy 20th birthday to you that's a phenomenal achievement what were your incentives then to start win without pitching because obviously there's a clue in the name but was there a time, and I say this as someone whose our agency is 13 years old, and I think it's probably safe to say, certainly in the UK, if not in the US and beyond, that the industry as a whole is in the poorest maybe financial health that it has been relatively, I suppose, in a long time. And I think you can point fingers in various directions and you can talk about media being you know, decoupled from creative because previously you could make a lot of money in media and then that, that cash cow for want of a better word, got taken away. So why was it pitching that you wanted to hone in on as being perhaps responsible for businesses not being as profitable and as healthy as they as they could and should be? I remember in my last agency job, I was in a meeting, uh, a new business meeting with the president of the agency. And the client said something positive about us, and he said, "I'd like you to uh, I'd like you to come back with some ideas, like some some creative concepts." And uh, my boss, the president of the agency, president and owner, said, "Sure." At the same time, I said, "No, we don't pitch." <laughs> and it was I was just fed up in that moment. I was tired of having to. Uh, give our thinking away for free. I, I think I, even though the guy I was with, the owner, president, and creative director, was one of the most talented creative people I had ever worked with. And I felt like we were one of the best, certainly design firms in North America. And I thought the idea that we would have to come in and pitch, pitch creative work for free was just offensive to me. And we weren't even pitching against anybody else as far as I knew. No. He, uh, he just wanted to free some, see some free work. And I thought, this isn't how this is supposed to work. And so in a moment of frustration, I finally put my foot down. <laughs> the uh, uncomfortable thing about it was my boss readily agreed to do it. And I, I forget what the conversation, I forget how we ended that conversation. But afterwards, he said to me, hey, I don't mind you taking this approach. I just, I would appreciate if you let me know in advance. Uh, but that moment sticks out to me as a moment where I just got fed up and I thought, this is stupid. We shouldn't have to do this. We're better than this. There's got to be a better way of us landing the client without having to give our thinking away for free. And I started experimenting a little bit, pushing back, using case studies and, and just drawing a line and saying no. And I, I got some early feedback that, you know what, it's possible. There's another way to do this, even though my entire career at that point 
the only way any agency I was ever with ever won any new business was by giving creative away for free, either in a direct sale with no competitors or in a formalized pitch. I had only ever done it that way with one exception that I can think of. So I was just fed up with it in the moment. And I think my pride, and I say that in the negative sense of the word, was bigger than that of my boss, the creative director. He was just used to the idea that this is the way you build a creative business. And I was fed up with it. And do you think that's still a big problem in the industry? And do you think anything has changed since that moment? Because I I think you might know Tom Lewis. He was at the IPA, uh, CFO. So Tom's a friend. He's been on the show. And we've he wrote a piece on consultative selling called Beating the Odds. And it was a curation of a few agency owners experiences and mine included and one of the stories I shared with him was that actually it was only since we refused to pitch that we are winning pitches uh, simply because and this uh, this sounds a bit like a soundbite and I you know I, I suppose I make no apologies for that but to me it always either ends a really bad conversation or it starts a really good one so it to us it's a qualifier of sorts but it's still in my experience and certainly what I see around me, it's still a huge problem. The market now has changed since I launched One Without Pitching 20 years ago. I see it in my, in my mind's eye, it is fully bifurcated, where on one side you have undifferentiated creative firms who are still bound by the old rules. And on the other side, you have typically highly specialized firms that solve niche problems for niche markets. And I think from, from where I sit, I uh, Win Without Pitching works with hundreds of agencies every year. And we wor- work with mostly firms in that latter group. So there's some selection bias in terms of my perspective on the industry. But I can go days without encountering a generalist creative firm, like m- many, many. I could talk to firm after firm after firm for days and not encounter a generalist creative firm. So I sometimes forget that they exist, but you know, all the big ad agencies, all the small agencies trying to look like big ad agencies, that used to be the entire market 20 years ago when I was growing up in this business. Today, and um, I do a podcast called Two Bobs with my co-host David C. Baker, and we did an episode recently on just on this very topic. And I read out the positioning language of the 20 most recent firms we had worked with. And then we broke down the use of the words. The word advertising didn't appear in any of them. Most of them were highly specialized firms. These highly specialized firms, they don't, they don't encounter the legacy problems of pitches and being asked to give creative away for free. It's just a different world. It's the world that I hoped we would see 20 years ago. And I, I'm sometimes guilty of forgetting that the old world still exists. Um, but, but it does exist. It, it exists at the large generalist ad agency level and then other, other independent firms that haven't made that decision to niche down their business and change the dynamics of the buy-sell relationship. It sounds like an absolutely bliss viewpoint that you have. It, it sounds like a glance at the future of, of, of the industry, having that that selection bias that you reference. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, th- so it used, to, it used to be this kind of utopian vision of the future, I, but I knew it was coming. Internet search was driving everything, right? Like you, a client no longer has to put up with a generalist when a specialist is so easily found. So it was just so obvious that this market was going to fragment and specialize and the power would shift away from the client who has innumerable alternatives to hiring any creative firm. It was going to shift away from the client to the specialist. And that has happened. And I, you know, when I talk to people in the old world, I sometimes, yeah, it does, it feels like stepping back in time. And it's probably a disparaging comment. It's going to sound like a disparaging comment, but it really feels to me like when I'm in a conversation with a generalist firm about the problems that I used to see all the time, 20, 15 years ago, it really is a throwback in time. It's an anachronistic moment for me where it's like, wow, oh yeah, these, these problems still exist. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're probably so far at the front of trying to drive this change that 
you kind of don't get to look back and see the sluggish ones following far behind. And I think the same is true. And it'd be keen to know your opinion on this, on, on just value pricing. I was in a discussion earlier in the week where someone was sharing some data about the volume of firms that have gone from solely practicing a billable hour to a more value-based pricing models. And actually, the stats weren't very reassuring at all. Although the data I noticed and flagged was was a few years old now. So I believe that 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 billable hour noose around people's necks has started to loosen. But is that the perception you have? Or do you solely work with value based pricing businesses? No, I know very few firms that do exclusively value based pricing. And it's not it's not my, my point of view is that there's no one right way to price. And that um, an agency should have a portfolio of pricing models. Sometimes you're pricing on value. Sometimes it just makes sense to sell time. It makes sense for you. It makes sense for the client. It's the nature of the engagement or, or parts of the engagement, parts of the service offering, you know, what we refer to as the logic. You know, sometimes it makes sense to sell that in units of time. It's easier to account for. So value-based pricing in an agency is hard. And um, I've written a book on it. I've sold... 5,000 copies of this book. I've talked, I've done dozens of speeches all around the world. So I've had the chance to affect thousands of firms on the subject of pricing. And I couldn't begin to hazard a guess at, you know, how much the needle has, how much I and my work, and I'm obviously standing on the shoulders of people like Tim Williams and Ron Baker. So I, I, I count them under, not underneath me is inappropriate, but trying to pay homage to them. Like, you know, if, if I look at the effect that we, we and others have had on the pricing of agency services, I think it's big in terms of, you know, if you add up the currency, if you add up the, add up the pound sterling that has been earned by agencies. But when you count the number of agencies who've made a fundamental shift to value-based pricing, it's still very low. And, it, and it's hard. I think there's, you know, so we say agency, but today agency is this catch-all term for kind of the generalist ad agencies and other generalist creative firms. And then the, all of these highly specialized design, software engineering, consulting hybrid firms that go after niches. So it's a, it's a, it's actually a larger bucket today than it was even 10, 15 years ago. Um, but some of the specialists, again, just like it's easier for them to push back on a flawed selection process, it's also easier for them, for some of them to price based on value. It's hard for an ad agency to, to value price. And how much of that do you think is due to the agency? And how much of that do you think is down to clients and their own procurement departments? Because one thing that I, and I, I shared this on a, on a previous episode, I've, I've reached a stage when we started this podcast of like trying to fight back the cynicism that I think happens at a certain age and a certain level of experience. And I thought I need to I need to find people who we admire. I need to put a microphone up to them and kind of share those smarts. And something that I think I am frustrated about is how many agencies point fingers at clients and blame them for problems at the same time backing themselves into a corner and allowing systems and flawed processes to continue. So where do you see the the blame for want of a better word? Oh yeah. So there, there's definitely the dynamics. There are ingrained practices on the buying and the selling side. So there are ingrained practices on the client side, especially when procurement gets involved. Um, but to me, it's the same conversation as the pitch 20 years ago, where the agency pointing the finger at the client saying, you know, it's your fault you did this. No, it's a, it's a function of marketplace dynamics. There are too many firms selling too similar services to too few clients. That's why the, the agency has, sorry, the client has all of the power, the power to push the client around, the agency around, the power to dictate how the agency's services will be bought and sold, and the power to dictate what the price will be. So until you build a meaningfully different differentiated business. And the way you do that is you go deeper into a niche, which means you specialize. If you don't do that, you're always going to be kind of ebbing with the tide. You're always, you're, you're, you're going to be a, 
a, a price taker in that market. Like a commodity, you're kind of commoditizing yourself perhaps. Yeah, you, you have little power in the buy-sell relationship because the source of the client's power is alternatives to hiring you. As soon as you limit the alternatives to hiring you, now you have the power to push back on how your services are bought and sold and you have the power to affect how you price. Pricing, I'm fond of saying, is a prison cell in your own mind of your own making. So I can take two different agency principles from owners or MDs who, who run similar firms in similar markets, and they will have this very narrow idea of what they're able to charge. And sometimes those very, very narrow ideas align. Sometimes one firm's narrow idea of what they can charge is twice what the other firm is. And when you start moving out of markets, you start broadening out the comparisons, you will see that there are firms that charge multiples of what other firms charge. So the way I think about it, I know you're working your way through my book, Pricing Creativity, but it's you have this idea of what you can charge. And again, think of that as a pri you're, you're locked in this prison cell of your own making. You start to learn some principles of pricing and you push the the, the the walls of that cell out, your cell becomes bigger. At some point you think you've dissolved the walls, but you haven't, you've just pushed them out. And then at some point you run into another boundary. And then there is a place, there is a day, if you keep working on this, there's a day when those cell walls dissolve altogether. And you take, let's, I'll do this in US dollars and I'll make some generalizations here. So you take a typical independent creative firm that's billing about, let's call it 150, maybe it's 175,000 US dollars per full-time equivalent employee. So that's not just the billable people, that's all of the people. Take your turnover, divide it by your head count, and you get this average, and it's somewhere between 150 and 200, and for some it's well below 150. And, and you think that revenue per full-time equivalent employee you feel like there are, there are market d dynamics and other forces that are working against you where it's really hard to get above 200 or 250 or 300. And then you, certainly 300 seems really hard. Then you start to encounter firms, if you're looking at the numbers, do 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, up to a million. Now, a million dollars in revenue per full-time equivalent employee. You can't do that selling time. You can't do that if you see the deliverables that you're selling, the campaign, the website, the app, et cetera, as constrained by these market forces in air quotes. You can only hit these numbers if you uh, start to appreciate the value that you help to create for your clients and you start to price based on that value. Yeah, well said. I'm really pleased that earlier you spoke, you said that there's no, you know, there's no right way of pricing. And of course, the billable hour will make sense in some contexts. But going back to the examples you've just shared, the firms who have their employees up to, say, $300 and, and, and beyond, do you find the ratio of what they're doing and the, the services that they offer does lean significantly more to value based pricing? Because, of course, I'm not trying to force you into a corner of saying one is right and one is wrong. But presumably, that has to be true if they are able to break that $300 ceiling. Yeah, it's not $300. It's $300,000 in annual revenue per full-time equivalent employee. And that, there seems to be, I wouldn't call it a ceiling, but there's this wall. There's this movable wall that you have to break through at somewhere. And it changes over time. And we're talking averages. So somebody listening to this might think, well, that that number doesn't sound right to me, but I'll call it $300,000 today, $300,000 in revenue per full-time equivalent employee, where you can't, you can't go beyond, you can't charge an hourly or a day rate higher, and you can't increase your billable utilization higher than what it is. So you, you bump up against that number and you think, well, it's, it's actually it's physically impossible. Like the laws of physics seem to be, or certainly the laws of math seem to be working against you. And, and, and they are working against you. Um, and there's a threshold that you cannot cross unless you change your pricing model. And it's, it seems to be at somewhere around that 250 to 300,000 US dollars. 
yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in today's exchange rate, probably doesn't do us any favours in the in the UK, but certainly a recent independent agency census, I think the um, the, the top performing agencies were about 150k. Yeah, I, w- I would say in the UK, the threshold's about 200 200 thousand pounds where it's like it's it's you you think and you're hearing this and you think well like i don't firms don't do that agencies don't do that yeah some do some do a lot more than that do you think that agencies are more receptive to adopting and 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 changing their pricing models since media was taken away by so many or from so many i should say well when media went away that changed the the legacy model Right. So like the actual, the, the origins of the pitch are actually quite valid um, because the money was in the commissions and it was the, the industry standard was that you, you took your 15% and that funded everything. It funded, it funded research, it funded account service, uh, it, it funded absolutely everything. And then that started to get eroded and then went away in a way completely uh, I know a lot of firms suffered, but really, I think that was the freeing moment when we became untethered from media. That's when we, those who understood the value that created and were willing to price on that basis. And sometimes price value-based pricing means putting skin in the game, which is known as performance pay. So it kind of opened the door for that. So it allowed us... Uh, it allowed us to get more creative in how we price. And that's, my book is called Pricing Creativity for that reason. We, we, it's a double entendre where we're, you know, uh, the subject is how to price creativity, but I wanted to, I want people to think about pricing as a creative act. Well, I, I, um, we do highly recommend that people check out pricing creativity and you can also get training videos alongside the book itself, which as Blair mentioned, I'm, I'm working my way through at the moment. You mentioned their skin in the game pricing or, or I suppose outcome based pricing as it can also be known. Where do you stand on that? Because certainly what I, what I implemented in my agency about seven years ago after the training I did with Tim Williams, I think I would jumped in the deep end of value-based pricing and learned that actually you can do yourself as much harm and get as bruised doing that as you can from the billable hour. I think output-based pricing is a more comfortable place to start. But outcome-based pricing, how realistic is that for most firms, do you think? Uh, again, you know, my idea of most firms is a little bit biased when I think of firms as being more independent, more specialized. Um, I think it's, it's quite realistic, but you, so there, there, there are three fundamental ways that you can price or three things that you can price and sell. You can sell the inputs of time and materials. You can sell the output or the deliverable, the campaign, the app, et cetera, or you can sell the outcome, the value to be created. And when you're, um, even generalist ad agencies have an opportunity to price based on outcome. But when you're a specialist and let's say you're vertically specialized, so you work in a category, you work in just one narrow category. You, when you work in a category, you tend to see, you see the patterns. And when an opportunity comes to you and a client has a problem and you think, oh, we've done this a few times before and you have some you have the experience, you have the ideas of what solutions work and to the extent that they work. Now you have some confidence in your ability to actually move the bottom line. You are in a better position to be able to take some risk if you choose to take it. So you can charge based on the outcome or the value to be created. And you don't even have to put skin in the game if you have confidence and you can transmit that. I don't mean just transmit your confidence, but you can you can get the client to see, to have the same level of confidence that you do in your ability to achieve results. So if you show up and say, listen, we, we've been in this situation before. We've, we've helped three or four different organizations like yours with a problem like this. Let me show you the case studies. We can, on average, we can improve profit by 33%, translates to 2.4 million pounds a year in a business like yours it would actually mean 2.6. We're confident in our ability to create 2.6 million in net new profit for you. The fee is 1.3 or 500,000 or you know whatever the number is. I don't want people to read anything into the numbers that I've just thrown out. But our, our fee is X. 
And you'll encounter situations where the client might be willing to pay it. A client might push back and say, you know, I'd be willing to pay you that really high number if I had some sense of guarantee. Now we're talking about some level of performance pay where let's say you're proposing to get paid 1.3 million. You might say, okay, well, we'll take half of that in fee and half of that in incentives based on, you know, hitting that target. You can graduate those incentives. There's just an innumerable, innumerable ways that you, you can actually slice and dice the, uh, the KPIs and the incentives when you start to put skin in the game. And skin in the game, you don't have to go all the way out to contingency pricing where you don't get paid anything until the results are achieved. And you don't have to go all the way to the other extreme where you're pricing based on value and you say to the client, no, we're going to help you create 2.6 million. We want half of that um, without any guarantee. So those are two ends of the spectrum when it comes to pricing on value. And then, you know, it's there are, there are different ways to, to move the needle between those two ends of the spectrum. And ultimately, you don't feel like you can just present one price. I know that's something that you focus on really well in, in pricing creativity and talking about the significance of having options. Yeah. So back to this idea that there are three different things that you can price and sell. You could put forward a proposal to a client with three options. And I, as you're alluding to, I'm a big advocate of the three option pricing. I got that from Tim Williams years ago. It's fairly standard pricing uh, technique but it's really powerful, put options in front of your client. You could align those options along the lines of the three different things that you can price and sell. So I could show, show up with a proposal and say to the client, listen, there's three, three different ways you can hire us to help you create this value. The first one I'll call partnership. This is where I'm pricing based on outcomes or value, where it's basically, we're going to work with you as intensely as we can over the, this period to help you achieve the goals that you're trying to achieve and create the value that you're looking to create. At the other end of the spectrum, if you just want to buy some time from us, we'll sell you some time. We'll sell you sprints or a block of hours, or you pay us hourly and we'll work away at it. In the middle, if you want a, a defined price, if you want us to commit to a price on for the campaign itself, here's the price. So in that, in that example, they can buy value, they can buy time, they can buy the output or the deliverable. So that's one way to do it. And even on the value-based price, you could put some skin in the game. You, you could say the price to us is one point, the fee to us is 1.3 million, but the way we're breaking it down is it's 750 in or 700,000 in fees and 600,000 in incentives based on us hitting certain targets. So these are just some examples, but so if you, if you put forward a three option proposal to a client, you might have one value-based price option. How often is the client going to take that value-based price option? Probably less than 33% of the time. So let's assume that an agency always puts forward a value-based option. That means at best, you're probably going to end up with 25% of your clients or projects priced based on value. But that that 25% is going to have a dramatic influence on the bottom line. It might double, triple, quadruple the bottom line, the EBITDA of the firm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's quite liberating as well. And we started to implement it and start thinking about how else can we price something and actually giving options. Because again, a point that I've heard you make, and it comes up in the book, is you're just you're just increasing the the odds of a client having something to say yes to. Yeah. And that's at the simplest level, your, your odds of, you know, you look at the potential outcomes. If I put forward a one option proposal, there are two options, yes or no, 50% positive, 50% negative. If I put forward three options, now there are three positive and one negative. I've gone from a 50%, 50% positive outcomes to 75% positive, positive outcomes, but that's the least um, meaningful reason to put forward options. The most important reason is you change the context of the decision the client is making. You're actually changing the question that you're asking them. You're going from asking them to answer the question, is this proposal worth this much money? 
to answering the question, which of these is the best value? And that latter question is the question the brain is wired to make. It's the question the clients are enabled to answer. In fact, if you put forward a single option, single price proposal, you they need context for the decision making. So you you force them to physically or just mentally leave to go bring the context to the decision that they have to make. And that that is a, a, a comparison. We think our proposal stands on its own, like as some sort of objective truth and the client will make this objective decision. The reality is most of the, most of the decisions that most of us make in our lives are subjective and contextual. We're constantly searching for context. So provide the context in your proposal by offering different ways that the client can engage you at different price points and then facilitate a discussion with the client on which option seems to be the best fit for them. You'll see how the, the dynamics of that closing conversation change. Yeah, wonderful. Well, that's cued a couple of listener questions that I've got for you, Blair, quite well. We interrupt this podcast to announce that we will never interrupt this podcast with ads. Ads that awkwardly nudge you to contact the pod's host, Giles Edwards, on 0189 952 007. Only the other day, some pod listening companies did just that, calling for guidance on strategy and brand identity. But we're not asking you to do that. Nope. Anyway, back to the show. And finally, brand purpose. Let's talk a little bit about brand purpose. What a load of fucking nonsense brand purpose is, yeah? Oh, the godfather of marketing, Mark Ritson, telling it like it is. Not what we were after. Hang on. So asking <coughs> the general public for their opinion, be it on Brexit or boat names, is notoriously fraught with danger. But that's not stopped us asking. So Lorraine asks, do you have any rules for quickly determining if a new business opportunity is worth pursuing? And how do you become more confident in turning down wrong fit clients? That's two questions. <laughs> it is two. <laughs> Cheeky Lorraine. Rules, yeah, like a whole set of rules, and you should have rules, Lorraine. So you write down, you write down the type of client that you want to work with, all of the variables that you can describe. Write down the clients that you don't, the variables of the clients that you won't work with, and then in the middle, write down the red flags where. Um, like for me in our business, an ESOP ownership structure, employee stock ownership plan, if all the employees are owners of the business, that's a red flag for us because those organizations have difficult time making decisions. We don't have a hard line about we won't do business with them. It's just a red flag that says, ask more questions, be careful, tread carefully here. So Lorraine, you, you should, so do I have r rules? The the rules are the lines that I demarcate based on you know who I want our organization to do business with and who I don't want to do business with, or I know that it's are likely to waste our time, or we're not we're not likely to to be able to affect the business. So it's not my rules that matter; it's your rules that matter. And what was the second part? How do I become more confident? Well, this comes from my friend and. Uh, podcast co-host David C. Baker, he called me one day and said, where does confidence come from? And I had an answer. And he said, no, that's wrong. He said, it comes from two places. He was driving through a snowstorm in the middle of America and he pulled over and I had this brainwave and he called me. He said, where does confidence come from? He said, it comes from two places and only two places. It comes from deeply held beliefs. So that's from our, our sense of self, uh, how we were raised, the the mix of genes and upbringing, uh, self-esteem, uh, and also our, our, our deeply held belief about our ability to help our clients and create value for our clients. And if you don't have that, then the second source is options. So what does options mean? Options means money in the bank. It means a big sales pipeline. And it means making sure, and I'm quoting David again here, making sure that your, your capacity is always somewhat constrained. Your opportunity always exceeds your capacity. So let's just think about that for a minute. 
uh, creative people are naturally optimistic people. And when you launch a creative firm, one of your biggest fears is you'll have to say no to a client because you, you can't do the work. You don't have the capacity. So independent creative firms tend to have more capacity than they, than they need, and they should have less capacity than they need. You should be in a situation where uh, a really good client opportunity comes to you from a new client, somebody you've always wanted to work with, and you have to say no. You should be in that situation from time to time where you have to say, you know, we would love to be able to do this for you, but we're full right now. Can you wait for six months? And, and maybe the client can't wait and they go away. And when you are capacity constrained in that manner, you force yourself to be more ruthless and pragmatic and discerning would be the most appropriate word about the clients that you take on your, and your confidence will erupt, will rise. Yeah, I think certainly, especially point two, point two definitely rings true. It's almost a privilege to, uh, to have options sometimes to give you that confidence. Uh, question two is from a David and David asks, what is your advice for how to successfully change your pricing models with current clients without pissing them off in the process? You reinvent your firm one new client at a time. And I wrote a post on this recently. I forget what it's called. Uh, Reboot your culture through new business. So you can find that on winwithoutpitching.com. And I think David and I did a David Baker and I did a podcast episode on it. So you can search for that in uh, at twobobs.com. So you, you, you see this, um, first of all, you have to learn the new pricing techniques. So let's say you read Pricing Creativity or one of Ron Baker's books or wherever, you, you, you get some new ideas and you think, okay, I'm going to put these new ideas into place. You draw a line in time. The new, new opportunities from uh, non-current clients that come to you, new opportunities from new clients, you price differently. You change the way you sell, you change the way you show up in the sale, you change the way you price. And in this way, you can be whoever you want to be. You, your firm can be whatever you want it to be in three to four years that it takes to turn over your client base on average. Now, that doesn't answer David's question. My but I wanted to lead with the point that it's easier to reinvent your pricing with new clients than it is with current clients. You might have to accept with current clients that the, the, the current prices are the current prices. However, what we've already spoken about, this point of offering options in your proposals, typically three, three different ways that you can engage us at three different price points, that's how you try to affect the pricing with new clients. So let's say a client comes to you with a project that um, you've done for them in the past, and there's this expectation that you'll charge a certain price. You might say, hey, we're, uh, we're thinking about these types of projects differently now. So I want to share with you three different ways that you could hire us at three different price points. And don't worry, like the, the way we've always done it is one of the options, but just bear with me while I walk you through the other options first, and then the, let the client choose. I think reinventing one at a time makes a lot of sense, but you're right. To me, it's just part of having grown up conversations and uh, pricing creativity quite rightly tr talks about the, you know, the significance of being comfortable talking about price. Cause I think again, whether that comes from confidence or experience or no doubt, you know, they're one of the same things in many respects, it's a significant obstacle for many people. Yeah. The confidence comes from experience. So get in there. I, I say in um, my first book, the win without pitching manifesto that, Money conversations are stressful because we don't, we don't talk about them. We defer them. And stress is caused by the things that we don't do. So if we want to get better at money conversations, we should talk about money more often, earlier and more often. And we, it's, it really is a lot like building a muscle. Um, we have to work out. We have to work on this over time. And over time, we will get more comfortable saying really big numbers and then pausing. But it does take... Uh, some practice and takes some people more practice than it takes other people. Yeah. Well said. At the final part of the interview, then the Blair is our four pertinent posers that we put to all of our guests, starting with what advice would you give to your younger self? I would say, beware of an old man from the future pretending to be you. He doesn't know shit. <laughs> Number two, if you could banish one thing from the industry, what would it be and why? 
If I could banish one thing, I think my old answer would have been search consultants, but I haven't, I can't remember last time I ran into a search consultant. So maybe my wish has come true. Oh, you really are living a good life. 20 years ago, I wrote an article titled Pitches, Search Consultants, and Hissing Cockroaches. You might be able to find it online. <laughs> nice. Oh, that would have made for a good quick fire question. Wicked. Um, aside from the win without pitching manifesto and pricing creativity, which is linked in the show notes, are there any other books that you would recommend to our listeners? Oh, so many books. Yeah. So if you're a specialized firm and you're specialized in a vertical, you should read $100 million offers by Alex Hermosi. And you'll look at, you'll listen to the title, you'll look at the book and you'll think, I'm not reading this book. Trust me, the guy's really smart and he's made just tens and tens of millions. So if you're working in a vertical where you spot the patterns, where you have this like convergent kind of model where you solve the problem for one and they have similar, very similar problems, man, that is a great book. I also love um, Greg Alexander's book, The Boutique, how to, I always get the subtitle wrong, how to like... Um, start, scale, and sell a professional services firm. And Greg runs a really interesting business called Collective 54. You can look that up online. And then my podcast partner, David C. Baker, um, he's got a bunch of great books. The Business of Expertise is his most recent one, but he's about to launch a new one. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to see, say the title, but he just showed me the finished copy the other day. So you can check out davidcbaker.com and find his books. So those are three off the top of my head. Awesome. And this is our, I think, 103rd or fourth episode. And they've not, not, none of those has come up before. So that's ace. Well, if David is comfortable sharing that, you can always send us a link prior to this going out. So listeners, if you scroll down in your notes, you might see a surprise. But if not, then do just Google David's name. Uh, number four, we always dedicate every episode to someone and we bestow that honour to our guest who has to give the reason why. So, Blair, would you kindly dedicate this episode to someone? I think I'll de uh, dedicate it to my wife and business partner, Colette Enns. Uh, when she came to work in the business full time, I don't know how many years ago, 2013-ish, it's when things changed for us and we are... Uh, it's appropriate because we're celebrating our the 20th anniversary of our business. And uh, last month, she and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. So I'll dedicate it to Colette. Congratulations. That's ace. Well, this episode is very proudly dedicated to Colette Ends. Wonderful. Uh, so as a final call to action, everyone head over to this episode online. There will be links to the Win Without Pitching Manifesto, to pricing creativity, the $100 million offers, the boutique, the business of expertise. We'll try and dig out that uh, to Bob's episode you mentioned as well and link to that. But how else can our listeners get more Blair Ends? Because I know there's a new podcast to plug. Yeah, I, I'm Blair Ends on Twitter and LinkedIn. Those are the social media platforms I use. They can find me uh, all my writings at winwithoutpitching.com. And as you pointed out, I have a brand new podcast uh, called 20% The Marketing Procurement Problem. The name is an inside joke that um, the inside joke is that uh, according to procurement, all agencies are always 20% higher than the next agency. So I have a co-host in that podcast, Leah Power. She and I are interviewing procurement people from some of the world's largest companies. And we're trying to solve the marketing procurement problem. So I'll let the listener decide for themselves what they think the marketing procurement problem is but we're trying to ha we're having conversations with people and talking about you know is value really being created here what's really going on here how do these three parties of agency uh, marketing and procurement work better together well we're going to link to that too fantastic so thank you so much for joining us Blair it's been a privilege and a pleasure uh, the pleasure was all mine, Giles. Thank you for the uh, invitation. And finally, thank you to everyone listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do share and review the pod. 
We really value your support. Keep the questions and guest requests coming in. To get in touch, it's easy to find Gasp online. You can check out CTA Pod on Instagram or just email hello at calltoaction.co. Yeah!